I've got bad news for you. I probably shouldn't sound so upbeat when I say I've got bad news. Anyways, bad news is you're hackable. Yeah, that's a tough thing to, to face. But the truth is, if you want to find out what it's like to be hackable, well, why don't you talk to the person who literally wrote the book on it? This is a great discussion with Ted Harrington. He's the best-selling author of Hackable, and he's on the Disco Posse podcast right now. What's up, crew? Welcome back. This is episode 193. Oh, wow. Ted Harrington. He's the author of Hackable. He's also the founder of ISE. They're doing some really fantastic stuff. Check out the links below. Find out all about Ted. He's a great public speaker, an expert in cybersecurity, white hat hacking, and really just we had a great discussion about personal choices in security and how to augment your own practices. Bust out your pen or your Evernote or whatever. Notion. Do, you, do that thing. Oh, speaking of do that thing, before we jump into the episode, I want to make sure that you can, if you could do me a favor and you could do that thing and, and maybe click subscribe because number one, helps us to amplify these amazing conversations. Also, hey, it lets you know when there's really cool new stuff coming, which there is new stuff coming every week. Every week. Now, we're pretty prolific here and it's going to get better. Anyways, enough about me. This is Ted Harrington on the Disco Posse podcast. Hi, I'm Ted Harrington, the executive partner at Independent Security Evaluators and the author of the number one best-selling book, Hackable, How to Do Application Security Right. And you're listening to the Disco Posse podcast. Thank you very much for joining. I'm excited because I've really, really found a lot of inbound interest in the space of ethical hacking, the importance of what we need to do to protect ourselves in especially, you know, a society that's going through interesting challenges that we've probably gone through since the 60s, but the technology has made it a lot easier to suddenly face, you know, some of the things that are out there. We've got businesses, we've got personal challenges, lots of fun stuff. But first of all, congratulations on the book, you know, number one book, and well-deserved from what I got through. As I mentioned before we started recording, I didn't get a chance to finish the whole book. I'm a terrible host, but the book is hackable. It's fantastic. And Ted, if you want to give a quick introduction to the folks that are new to you, and then we'll jump in. We'll talk about what you do with ISE. We'll talk about hackable and really the background of the importance of what you do. Sure. Yeah. So uh, at ISC, what we are is we're, we're the good guy hackers, right? And so when companies are struggling to, or even if they're not necessarily struggling yet, but if they're trying to understand how an attacker might attack their system and might find vulnerabilities they can exploit, that's why you would bring in someone like us. And the reason I mention that is not necessarily to like pitch or promote ISC, although I obviously I'm a big fan of the company. Uh, <laughs> um, I love it. Uh, my point more was to give everyone sort of a, a an, an understanding of the corner of the world that I live in. And through the course of, you know, serving some of the largest tech pioneers really in the world, all the way down to companies who no one knows of yet because they're just coming out of their you know, maybe first or second rounds of funding. I get to be in this really privileged position where we're working with these companies who are trying to solve some problem in the world through technology. And that's an amazing, like just as someone who's like service oriented, that's just a wonderful position to be in. But I also realized over the many years of doing this, that it's, it really struck me that everybody seems to have the same problems, whether you're talking about, you know, a fortune 10 tech company or all the way down to those, you know, companies who, have an idea and they're a couple people and they have a couple million dollars in funding and they haven't, they don't know exactly how they're going to go to market yet. Everyone seems to have those same problems. And as I, and I'm talking about with securing their solution, they have the same 10 security problems. And I thought that was really interesting once I first observed that. And then I started thinking about, well, how do you solve those common problems? If everyone has them, how do we solve them? And the thing that really struck me about that was that the conventional approaches, the way that most people talk about solving those problems are wrong. And that was what motivated me to write Hackable. Uh, I wanted to write a book 
that really identified the, the sort of common plight that everybody building software systems has uh, in terms of how do you secure them, not in terms of how do you necessarily build them, but how do you secure them? And I wanted to identify those common problems. I wanted to say, look, this, everybody thinks it's X. Actually, it should be Y. And here's how you do that. And so that's sort of my background is I take these insights that I've learned from the front lines of leading this really incredible group of ethical hackers. And I put it all in a book to say, here's what you should do. Here's why you should do it. Here's how you do it. And, uh, and so that's sort of where I come from. It, it's an interesting thing. I did a lot of my own background covering business continuity and disaster recovery, and it inevitably bumped into the security aspect of things. It was sort of running in parallel to groups that were thinking more about it's gone wrong. How do we deal with it? And in disaster recovery, it's along the same lines of you're not supposed to plan the test, you're supposed to test the plan. And it becomes a matter of like, assume you've lost more than you think you're going to lose. And so I loved the mindset when I suddenly started working more tightly with a security organization, which at the time was new because I, I, look, I work for massive financial organizations and yet there was no CISO. Like that wasn't even a role at the time. It was fairly new. And then you'd get to these folks and most people that are running the systems that are building these applications, they're just thinking like, I'm building this amazing thing. And it's just, all I have to do is test for what works and what the customer's asking. Never thinking that you just like the easiest possible, like cross site vulnerabilities are just glaringly hanging off of every URL and every just strap on a dot XML to any URL. And suddenly you're exposing all this weird stuff. It was, but they didn't think for that because they look and they've got a set of user stories. Right. User stories have specific application outcomes. Securing the app is always at the end, right before they go live. They're like, we should probably run some kind of a penetration test on it to make sure. And they're more looking, does it go down if you throw too much load at it? They're actually not thinking about actively making the system vulnerable to like expose it like sh we should exploit it for good to make sure that because mm -hmm. if we don't do it somebody else will right <laughs> right yeah it's it's interesting the distinction that you're identifying here right which is i think the metaphor here I'm, I'm a big believer in trying to simplify these really technical complex topics into metaphors and stories the, the metaphor here really is we think about what it takes to build a skyscraper right the gen the contractor who builds skyscrapers undeniably they're the expert in how do you take all of these disparate components and all these disparate systems and make them work together so that at the end you have this beautiful building that functions in all these great ways and everybody's safe and all this stuff and that's their focus is how do i take this thing that's disassembled and assemble it in you know how do i build something if you went to that contractor and you said now we need you to demo it and we need to demolish it they'd be like well okay, maybe I might have some idea of how I might do that because I like know where maybe some of the weaknesses are, but that's not what I spend every waking minute of every day doing. And that, that same absurdity, like when, when you see those, we've all seen that clip of like a, you know, Las Vegas casino being imploded on the strip yeah. to make room for the next one. And those, they're always very controlled, right? And it's like, you see this building implode on itself and that is so intently designed to do that way and that's because the person who does that that's what they spend every waking minute every day understanding how to do and so it would be absurd of us to say hey you build buildings we're trying to demolish this las vegas casino go demolish it and but that is actually what we are asking of developers today we're asking them to say, hey, you're, you're this uh, incredible developer. You know how to build these clean, efficient systems. Um, oh, but also make sure that you know how it will be ripped to shreds by an attacker <laughs> who spends every waking minute doing that. It's like, guys, that's just not practical. And that's why the role of just the whole field of ethical hacking, but you know, security in general as well, really matters and is very different. Breaking and building are two completely different things. And what I find is that the human assumption is always towards good or 
predominantly towards good. Most people have been taught to, you know, look for the silver lining, to think people are, are by nature good people, assume the best, you know, plan for the worst, but assume the best. Like, and it's really, really tough. Like you said, you've got people, they're, they're builders, they're creators. They should remove the shackles of destruction and create something fantastic. And then, you know, but through that, it, we can't make it the thing we do at the very end. And this is what I found. The two things that always got shaved off the project plan, because when we looked at it, like it's going to take us nine months to get this thing out. You know, we were like traditional waterfall methodology. And they'd say, whoa, you know, we need this in, in six months. I need it by December 1. And I said, well, what can we strip out? Well, QA is eating up three weeks. So let's cut that down to one week user <laughs> testing in general is like well i'll do the the project manager would say i'll do the user testing <laughs> like, oh yeah. no this is not gonna go well and so like we can shave another three weeks off there and i mean security look we own the firewall so we don't need to do that much oh man <laughs> and it was like every time it just played out the same thing and in the end you realize like the the exposure is not the assumption is not the outside world getting in through the firewall, like they've drilled a hole through the internet to get in there. It's the fact that they already got in through a USB stick or a set of malware, or you know, Pete from sales took his laptop and plugged it into a Starbucks, you know, or went to a Starbucks and someone had a Wi-Fi pineapple and they did a man in the middle. Like there's so many ways that have nothing to do with the firewall, <laughs> but they just have this unfortunate belief that I've got this magical thing called a firewall and there's no way stuff can get through it. Yeah, you, it's, it's amazing how what you're talking about right now is the inherent way that humans think and the assumptions that we make. And this is actually one of my favorite areas to talk about security because it is seen as, and, and is, to be honest, um, but it's seen as this highly technical, highly complex, it's all about ones and zero. It's like, we're talking about computing systems, but the human element is so critical to this. And I don't just mean like the person who plugs in the USB stick, but the person who built the thing thinks a certain way. And I'll tell you, this is, this is a true story that has happened so many times. I can't even count it where we'll be uh, in a room. And, and like I mentioned, um, you know, what we do is we help people understand how someone would attack their system. So that means that the conversations that I have when I'm in a room is we'll be talking to people about like, well, what if, what if X, what if the attacker did X? And I can't tell you how many times we'll ask that question. Okay. Well, what if an attacker did blank? And the response is, oh, well, no one would think to do that. And I'm like, we literally just <laughs> did. <laughs> like I literally just thought of it and asked you about it. And so if I thought of it or if our team thought of it, an attacker is out there and probably already has thought of it. And that's a really common thing. And it, it almost sounds like I'm making that up because it's so ridiculous. But people genuinely do believe that. Like the user will never do it that way. No one will think that that's such a complex idea. No one would think to do that. Um, and and I, don't, I don't actually blame anybody for that thinking because you hit the nail on the head. You know, we're wired really to be positive. As human beings, we want to think positively. We're most of us are optimistic. Even those of us that are pessimists have like this optimistic bent. Uh, but instead, what we need to do from a security perspective is we need to do the opposite, is we need to really assume hostility. We need to think, well, what happens when this is already broken and work backwards from there? And here's what makes that really difficult is it's kind of like for anyone who's seen, you know, the Matrix. Uh, but for those of you who haven't seen the Matrix, sort of the premise is there's this like beautiful utopian society and you can unplug from it. But once you unplug from it, you realize, man, unplugging from it might even be worse. And you can't go back into the utopian society very easily. Like once you know that the real, what the utopian society really is. And so that's kind of what it's like for ethical hackers. It's like, we have stepped out of the matrix. And now yeah. the way we see the world is all the ways that someone could break something. All the, like, we see the bad. I mean, we obviously see good in the world too. I don't mean to say that like, we're just negatively wired, but like when I see a line, like to wait in line for something, whatever the thing is, most people are like, I will now find the back of this line. And I'm like, 
where's the VIP line? I don't want to wait in this. Like, how do I not wait in this line? And that's the way that, you know, you have to think because systems are designed by people. They do have flaws and they can be broken. And it's, I always, the human hacking is one of the most exciting things. I've been a long time people watcher and I've always enjoyed like looking for human exploitation. And I, I exploit is such a, it sounds like a dangerous word. It's more like leveraging a possibility, you know, le- leveraging an, an opportunity, not exploit as in, you know, human trafficking type exploitation. But I'm talking just like find a thing that they will do that they didn't realize that they would do. And I remember like being in one of the trains in Las Vegas and there's like talk about the greatest place to people watch Las Vegas is it. <laughs> and there was uh, a, a couple that were there and they had a bag, you know, with their address tag hanging off the bag. And like, number one, you're literally exposing your personal information to the world. And then on top of that, they have a, little bag that says happy birthday and so just for fun i'm like let me see how far i can get this i'm like that's wild i said do not tell me that tomorrow's your birthday because it's my birthday too and she's like oh no no my birthday's in october this is for a friend of ours i was like oh october no way my wife's birthday is in october what day is it she's like it's the 16th i'm like awesome so i know her birthday i know her address and i'm like this it's that easy for somebody to give it up and we the same thing with security like passwords people would often say you know like well i've i've got a highly secure password and i would test this internally my idea it wasn't even in security and i would know i've got to test this i would just phone somebody from any internal line it could be a closet in the room back when you had offices that is right and i would just phone say oh hey this is john from the help desk uh it I think we've got a problem. It looks like someone's used your password on the mainframe. I just need to confirm, is it, you know, like Monday, one, two, three, because that's what it looks like it's been changed to. And they're like, no, 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 that's not. I'm like, okay, wh- what's the password you use last? And they just immediately, they're like, it's coming from an internal line. They said they're from the help desk. I'm worried about me getting blamed for something. Of course, I'll give you my password right now. Right. Yeah, it's, Paul, I mean, it's a human tendency. Like the first thing is like, oh God, I got to get out of trouble. And the first thing they do is they walk right into it. <laughs> yeah, passwords, passwords are an interesting thing. The way that uh, people default to trust and you know fall into um, being victimized themselves is, is really interesting. But one of the, because it, it, we're talking about passwords, I like to think about how do we attack the concept of authentication and the concept of authorization and there's so if you think about the way systems work i can give you a really interesting example of the way that when systems when assumptions about how systems are built are flawed and that leads to real challenges so there was a there was a particular application that we were doing what's called a security assessment of which basically means you're looking at it trying to find the vulnerabilities so you can understand how to fix them and we found that there were two problems with this system. The first problem was that it had an issue that's called information leakage. And I'm going to really, really simplify the technical details because, well, first of all, don't want to lose anybody, but also I don't, they're not <laughs> as important. Um, but information leakage basically means that the system gives up information it shouldn't, right? Like it, um, in this case, what it meant was that any user of the system could get the user identifier of every other user of the system. Now, information leakage, that's not great. Like that, you don't want to be giving away information as you just told with the Las Vegas train story. Like you just shouldn't give away information freely. Uh, and this was an example where the system was by design giving away information freely. But it's not directly exploitable. There's not much you can do with just knowing some other user's user ID. The second issue we found was where what's called the authorization model, which means the, the right or the permission to do something was broken. So what broken authorization means is that the way that the system allows you to do something doesn't work correctly or doesn't work in a secure manner. And so in this case, what it meant, and this is now tying it back to passwords, if someone, if a user of the system wanted to change their credentials, they want to change their password, 
Um, what they had to do was they had to supply information. Like think of any time you've ever tried to change your password, you usually have to supply the old, the current password in order to create a new one. Well, in this case, you had to supply information, but you didn't have to supply the password. You had to supply the user identifier. Now, the idea there is, of course, you only know your own user ID. So if you want to right. change your password, you just say, hey, I'm, you know, whatever the user ID is. But when you combine that with the user ID information leakage issue, now it means that an attacker can identify every user in the system. And once they have that user identifier, they can change the credentials for every user in the system, including the admin users. And that means that any user of the system can take over the entire system. Now, imagine that was like a bank or right. something where you really needed a, a medical device. Imagine you needed something, you know, access to it. These are the kinds of things, these are like the higher order types of security challenges that I find really, really interesting. And most people don't even think about, and there's no, there's no tool out there. You can't run an automated scanner that would figure out like, Hey, user identifier combined with broken authorization model means complete system compromise. And these are the kinds of things that we have to be thinking about when we're looking at systems is that, you know, people can really attack the way that the whole credentialing even works. Yeah. And it, it, interesting thing now, and let's actually, if you don't mind, we'll dive in on password managers and password authentication. This is something that I know is a really, really tough challenge for folks to like, oh, you know, password manager. I've got to, they've got to now understand what a password manager is, but it's, it's actually the best way because a lot of them now are, are built in a way that they much more easily integrate with browsers, with systems. And, and definitely, you know, the idea of using unique passwords, complex passwords is made easier. I remember back in, I took my MCSE one on Microsoft, like Windows 2000 back in the day. And I remember one of the, the questions, my favorite question ever, because it actually had human, not system implications. It said, in order to make a password secure, you can do one, which of the following? And of course, they've got like minimum length, minimum, you know, since last change, maximum age and complexity. And if you selected all of them, the answer was wrong. And their justification was that based on user behavior, if you made somebody have a really complex password with a minimum age, they're incented to write it down because they can't, they can't keep up with it. So right. by doing that, it, it was interesting that it added more than just a systematic approach to complexity and safety that it's like people are going to have this password and so they're going to write it down and they're going to put it on a sticky note beside their keyboard or under their keyboard for security. <laughs> right. you know? But so password managers, the idea of like TOTP and other authentication methods Ted, what are we seeing done right? And what are we seeing done wrong right now around that area? Yeah, I'm, I'm a big believer in the utility of uh, password managers um, for one very specific reason. And it is the ability to have unique passwords across different sites. Because uh, that's the thing that really trips people up is that because we all have so many accounts and so many services, if you're trying to remember them or even if you try to write them down, they it winds up being the same password across sites. And here's why that's a problem. A lot of people don't realize that's a problem. They're like, well, if it's a good password, who cares? <laughs> but here's why. Because we, we have to do, and this is one of the arguments that I, I make in my book and actually to literally anybody who will ever listen to me, is you know we have to think like the attacker. And here's what an attacker does. So, or one of the things that attackers, there's many techniques, but one thing that uh, attackers will do is once a certain system has been compromised or there's say a database of credential pairs has been, um, has been leaked, they're just like you and me, that we all want the most efficient way to achieve an outcome. Or maybe everybody doesn't want efficiency. I, should, I shouldn't generalize, but most people want to be efficient. They want to say, what's, you know, how can I get the best outcome, the most efficient, simple way to achieve what I'm looking for? And so what will an attacker do? They'll go take one of these leaked password databases and they'll say, I bet you a lot of the people who have these password at this service that just got hacked probably use those same credential pairs at 
every other service. So what will they do? They'll now go try those credential pairs everywhere else. They'll go try them at banks, at more at wherever your mortgage is, your car loan, like where your money is. Yeah. And a considerable percentage of them will work because people reuse passwords. So enter password managers. What does a password manager let you do? It lets you come up with the longest, most complex, most gibberish password for each service. And then you don't have to remember it. All you have to remember is your master, uh, yeah, the master password to unlock the password manager. And then I have a, an additional thing I always recommend, which is use a modifier to change the password so that what's in the password manager is not the same thing that's used on the site in case the password manager gets popped. But what that enables you to do now, it's so much easier to log into your sites because you don't have to like, type everything in and you're able to use that, uh, achieve unique passwords. That's, that's really the big thing. But it's the funny thing is the selling point, what makes people say, okay, I'll do that has nothing to do with improved security. It's this will be easier for you because of the browser extension. It will fill the password in for you and you just hit login. And people are like, oh, I can get down with that. Yeah. Now, this is the interesting thing, too, because I've, I have find people land on both sides of that. They're like, if it's automatically putting it in, they like, what if that plugin gets compromised? Like, because a lot of people don't trust the black box of the transition from the password manager to the end site. It's ironic that, you know, like they're the ones that will burn their envelopes so that they don't, you know, put them in the recycling by accident, but then they won't trust something which is secure and then they'll give up in another area. But like, right. so what should you say to people who are like, I don't trust that this thing's doing all this stuff for me because I don't know that I hear all the time about these ransomware attacks and, right. you know, security systems being compromised. What if my password manager gets compromised? Yeah, and, and make no doubt about it, password managers do get compromised. Uh, we actually published a piece of research that showed exactly that, how we could actually extract secrets even from locked mode and secrets being the password. So that's sort of like the worst case scenario. And after that research came out, a lot of people said, oh, should we not use password managers? Like, no, no, no. We should definitely use pass password managers is better than not using password managers. These are some sophisticated techniques. Um, but so there's two things I want to say about your question. So the first thing is I actually applaud the people who have that dose of skepticism. That's, we want that, right? We want people right. to hesitate when it comes to security. That's great. But the second thing is, and this is another awesome thing is that how do we deal with this problem of like, well, if I don't necessarily trust how this password manager is integrated with the browser plugin, um, that leads to the thing I was alluding to before, which is using a modifier, because now that completely eliminates that problem too. And so here's the simplest way to describe how you use a modifier. It sounds a little complex, and I will admit that it takes a little bit of getting used to, but once you get in the rhythm of it and you have it set up, it's so much easier and it solves, it's, it takes the security challenge and like significantly uh, improves it. And so basically what it is, is you've got your whatever is this long, complex, nonsensical, you know, as complex and unique a password you can in the password manager. But when you create the account, you then have this modifier, you add something short to change it. So that could be as, you know, a few numbers or letters or something. And that what's cool is that modifier that can be the same on every site. So the idea would be, you've got this long thing in the password manager, the password manager enters it in the site during that login, uh, the browser you know, plugin thing. And then you right. manually type in those couple details that are the um, modifier. And then when you log in, so now the service thinks that the combination of those two is the password, because that is the password. But in the password manager, that only has actually part of the password. So now think of all the things that an attacker could compromise. If the attacker compromises the password manager, they only have part of the password. The attacker somehow compromises the communication of the plugin. They only have part of the password. If the attacker compromises the service that does have the full password, they only take that service, not all of your services. So that's a really, really powerful situation. And it is so low in sophistication. Like anyone's, you know, grandparents can do that. It's just a matter of teaching them how to do it. 
Yeah, in in order for it to truly be you to be compromised, the hacker would have to have multiple systems with your known password and basically look for the identifier being different. They don't care that much about like they want fast path to compromise, which is there's way better ways to get that. Yep. as we see from the data dumps that are going on on a regular basis, right? It's, totally. So yeah, that is really interesting. And like you said, it can be a fairly simple thing, but it's such a such a help in, in making it like humanly accessible and technically complex. I love it. Now, the other thing is the classic questions. So What's your mother's maiden name? And I always, you know, the joke on Twitter, I often see someone says, you can tell a security person when you hear them on the phone with someone, they say, you know, but you know, the question is, what's your mother's maiden name? And you say, Spanish Armada 1478 49. Like it's <laughs> like they've got weird answers for common questions. So you, yeah. even if you found out the real information, you couldn't actually glue it together for password recovery. <laughs> When we do those questions, Ted, is there a, a, is it good? Is it bad? Like, what are ways that people should be aware that that could be compromising as well? Oh yeah, hundred percent. All that, all those information, all those pieces of information are uh, publicly accessible for the most part. Uh, some of them aren't. Like, what was your favorite vacation? I don't know. Well, but I don't know. Maybe you can still find that on Facebook. But a lot of the identifying. Yeah questions are publicly available information and the way to deal with those is also really simple um just use your password manager again so now you've got your pat in the password manager they have like a little notes field for each um each account and then what you can do is in there you can state like what was the question that you answered that you answered for your security question and then just generate a password and so yeah it'll have that when when you do call someone and it's going to be like it's uppercase my maiden my mother's maiden name is uppercase m lowercase l ampersand, you know, they're like, <laughs> but it doesn't <laughs> matter because you're trying to, you need it to just verify um, identity. You should not use real information. What some people will use is um, like modified information. Like they might say for their mother's maiden name, they might be something else that they can always remember. And like in their mind, they make that transmutation. Like instead of their mother's maiden name, maybe they always answer like, the the number the number of what their house was growing up or something and so like right. that's another way that you could potentially do it an attacker is not gonna like go to that level of uh trying all these different comp uh, combinations yeah and it's like you said it's easy like transposition is an easy thing it's actually kind of fun you know when you think of like when we used to do all the like anagrams if you can do an anagram and you're excited by that simple transposition of data like that is super easy and very yeah. very effective now on the sms as second factor and i apologize i'm like pulling you down this like road of like human you know hacking on password level but and this is stuff that i people ask me all the time about tips i'm like yeah. i can give you my tips but i don't think they're the right tips right. Well, i know ted has the real tips SMS as a second factor and the idea for TOTP and different types of authentication. Again, what are your thoughts on, is it, is it effective? Are there better alternatives? Like we, cause we don't often have a choice as a consumer. My bank doesn't have a second option, right? They only have mm -hmm. that. They don't have an authenticator app or so this is their second factor, but is it, it's better than nothing. Yep. And this is always that sort of battle of what's the right, compromise with what's available versus not having it yeah i mean this this one is actually pretty simple and straightforward and it's this uh despite resistance that people might have you always want to enable multi-factor authentication wherever you can because and here's why a lot of people don't necessarily understand why and that's i think that's one of the real problems that we in the security community have is that maybe we don't do a, as good enough job helping people understand why they have to do something. They're like, oh, I have to do this thing because I'm told to do it. And as human yeah. beings, we don't like doing things just because we're told to do them. But if we understand why, then we usually can come around. Even if sometimes we don't agree with the why, we'll be like, well, at least I understand why I have to do this. So the reason that multi-factor is really effective is it does what's called raises the attack requirement. So it makes it significantly more difficult for an attacker to compromise you if you have multi-factor and here's why 
So if you have single factor, that means you are presenting something that you know, which is your password. Now, as we've discussed already at length today, and we don't need to belabor, uh, passwords can get compromised, even if it's not your fault. The service gets broken, and now you're, the thing that you think to be secret is now known. And when you only have that single factor, then when someone knows the secret, game over. Multi-factor adds a second thing, and it's now saying you have to present something you know, which is your password, and prove something that you have, like your phone, or something that you are, like a biometric. The combination of those two things means that, A, an attacker can't really achieve a widespread compromise. They can't do this to millions of people at the same time. And the second is the likelihood that they get you is really low. Because think of what they'd have to do. They'd have to know your password and they'd have to have stolen your phone. Okay, maybe you lost your phone, but what's the likelihood that the person who got the phone also knows your password? Like those right. things aren't, um, the, the likelihood is a lot lower. So the first question, which, was, which you didn't ask, but was, is within the question is, why should I even bother with multi-factor? And that's why, because it makes it way harder for an attacker to be successful. So always use multi-factor, even though it might feel like it's annoying because now you have to like type something. It's like, just do it. It's so much better. Um, the second question, which is, well, what should I do when my only option is SMS? Do SMS. I mean, that's, if that's your only option, <laughs> do SMS. If you have an option to use an authenticator app, use an authenticator app because they are better. Um, and some people get a little confused on how to set them up. They're so easy to set up. It's literally pointing your camera at a QR code and it's an app that gives you the, the one-time password. So um, always use multi-factor. If SMS is your only option, that's okay. And if what I would recommend, again, some, some companies will try to present uh, the second factor as sending you an email. That's actually not a second factor because if they already have your email address, then it's not really a second factor if you're sending something yeah. to the email. So, Well, and this is the, f I've got a personal story on this one. On the Authenticator app, I, I don't want to say choose one versus the other. And I definitely don't want to say Ted is saying choose one or the other. But I'll tell you yeah. my personal story. I used to use Google Authenticator. And it was because it was, oh, this is great. You know, it did what I needed to do. I had a couple of services set up. It was fantastic, right? I love the second factor. Easy to do. You scan it. Life is good. And then my phone got destroyed. I had mm. like, oh, darn it. No big deal. Restore from iCloud backup. Open my Google Authenticator. It's empty. So I took a look at the Google Authenticator instructions, which are a challenge to find because Google hates humans. Uh, it's I finally figured out that they say they don't back it up because that would be insecure. I'm like, okay, conceptually, I understand what you're saying, but it's in a secure iCloud backup, which is so... Again, and it's a second factor. There's a lot of things that told me that that was a Bravo Sierra answer, but it was the one I was stuck with. So I've actually moved over and I use Authy today. Again, it's, it's mm -hmm. one you choose your choose your one you like. It's That's the one that I find. And because it does back it up and restore it within my secure backup. So I feel better because I had some goofy system that I had left like a tiny little thing running that I was getting like a $3 a month charge. It's silly, but it was irritating. It could have been a hundred or $50,000 a month, whatever it was. But so $3 a month, I got charged because when I went to go to authenticate to that system, it needed my multi-factor authentication. And because they were super secure, they had no way to unlock it without this multi-factor. So it was literally, I've got this orphaned off service and I phoned their people and I had access to the help desk and they're like, it's irreversible. We can't do it. That's our policy is we cannot unlock it unless you've got this multiple factors. So I've got this orphaned off service until eventually the credit card expires and it stops charging me. That was literally yeah. the only way I could get out of this thing. It was the silliest thing, but I, you know, again, it was the system had outthought me for some reason on that one. And maybe it was a rare case, but you know, 
So authenticators, I'm with you. Authenticators are good. They're super easy to use and more and more people are using them. I find now that as they get it for corporate email and they get other corporate systems, the good news is it kind of lets them translate that to their personal life. So when they go to the bank and the bank's like, you should use an authenticator app. They're like, oh, cool. I use this for work email. I may as well just right. use the same one. I'm like, yay, we're, we're getting closer. <laughs> yep. Yep. Yeah. That story is definitely uh, the un undiscussed part of multi-factor is that you actually need a, a multi-factor recovery plan. Um, but uh, it could also be having that, that system installed in multiple devices. Like if you had right. it on your iPad too, but that was requiring you to. Well, and actually, sorry. And I should, I shouldn't wholly blame Google, although it's a joyous thing that I like to do. <laughs> there is an option when you set your first scan to print off a set of backup codes. And because I think I'm smarter than the technology, I did not do so. Right. So I there are generally options up front, but I'm like, I'm a technologist and I got lost in the shuffle. If you're an average consumer that doesn't think much about tech and doesn't want to think about tech, you you can see why the barriers are there and, and this is why people you know write down their kid's birthday as a password and glue it to right. the fridge. Now the other thing as well, this idea that you talk about evolution, you know, evolving systems need evolving hacking, right? Mm -hmm. The idea of hack it again. And I love mm -hmm. this this concept in the book because we seem to think that when we build the system to start with, that all right. Boop, you check the checkbox. We ran a pen test. We did what we needed to do. We, we, we passed all that we needed to. Well, then they continue to inject new code into the system. The rest of the adjacent systems change, but we don't often go back to revisit this thing. So tell about the importance of, of hack it again, Ted, and, and who's doing this well. I'd actually love to hear where people are see the awareness and the importance of doing it. Yeah. So the only constant is change. That is the only guarantee that we can ensure is going to always be around. Uh, picking up just a little bit of feedback from myself, maybe. Oh, on your no, it counts for fine in here. So uh, that's always the oddity of audio systems. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, that's actually a good example of where uh, tech will fail us eventually. <laughs> so, <laughs> so the only constant is change. And what that means is that, I mean, you hit the nail on the head already, but that systems will continue to be developed and including even systems that are very stable and very mature there's you're still developing them or maintaining them uh, but even if there was like literally no change to the system the attackers change new attack techniques change the integration that any system might have with a third party is uh that third party might have some sort of change in its attack landscape and so the idea is that it's never done. There, I was having lunch in Amsterdam uh, right before pandemic, which feels like, oh, I was having lunch a few months ago. And it was like almost two years ago. <laughs> I know. Uh, it's scary to think how far it is now. Dude. Oh. So having lunch with this, uh, this executive from you know one of these major tech companies that all of us know and use every day in our lives. And he was making this really interesting comment about that he said, you know, there's no finish line for security. And I thought that was a great way to say it. There's no finish line because uh, as, and en as engineers, often what we want to do is we want to think about it as a discrete project that has a conclusion, right? We set out to do X, we achieved X by Y date. We're now done, but that's not the way security works. Security is not a line. Security is a loop. Security has a process, but the end of the process puts you back at the beginning of the process again. And so that's what this idea of hack it again, right? You, the first thing you do is you, you want to hack your system. You want to find the issues. Then the next thing is you need to actually fix those issues. And then the thing after that is you now need to go attack it again and, and find what additional issues remain unresolved or maybe hadn't been discovered yet. And that's really what this premise is all about. And uh, yeah, I can tell you a story. I can tell you endless stories, but one that comes to mind about you know, maybe a company that was doing this really well we have this customer who uh, they're really, really, really good at 
translating the findings that come out of a security assessment we do for them, not only into fixing the problem, like directly, hey, we found this problem, fix this problem in this way. They're good at doing that. But they're really good too at taking those, uh, the underlying principle, the underlying engineering principle that caused the failure and learning from that. So what that means is that this company, they're really good at, they keep getting better and better and better in terms of their development practices. And so that means that over time, they were introducing fewer and fewer vulnerabilities. So actually our reports wound up having a smaller and smaller and smaller number of issues for them to fix. And it got to a point where after several years of this, the number of issues that we were discovering was, I mean, it was small and some, there were some rounds where it was like, we didn't find anything. Wow. Uh, that, that's pretty rare when you don't find something, but there were cases where that happened. And most of them was maybe just a few issues, but then something changed. We came back with a report that had dozens of issues and those issues actually put them in scope for some uh, fines because they were now out of compliance with what's called GDPR, which is a, it's a, a, a regulation in Europe that has to do with yeah. privacy of information. And there's huge fines if you violate it. And because what had happened was in between those two assessments, the one before where almost no issues had been found, and then this one they had changed their model and they had changed to this cloud hosting model that leveraged, um, you know, services in Europe. And they were now exposed to fines for every instance of failure. And it was, when you added it up, it was like, I forget what the exact dollar was. I think it was 10 or 20 million euros was what the fines would have been. And that's, I mean, talk about something that like motivated, you know, anyone to go take action on it. But the, what I think is really interesting about that story is, Here's a company that's doing it right. They are on, on the appropriate cadence. They're doing the right type of security testing. They're uh, applying the appropriate budget so they can be thorough enough. I mean, these are all areas that most companies fail. They're translating those findings in terms of how do they improve their development practices. And yet even they still wind up finding issues down the road. And that's why this idea of continuing to look for issues matters because things change yeah i mean they're effectively using what almost like anti-fragile system development more so like so with every new learning they create an antibody to that outcome in to inject further back in the development cycle and it's mm -hmm. it's a rarity when you can see it we hear i mean people talk today about this idea of shift left you know, as far yeah. as security development practices, but that's like one step further where not only are they like just moving security into the development pipeline, but they are literally taking tested outcomes and uh, using like test driven development, those other development methodologies and injecting stuff. That's fantastic. And like you said, they've done all that they should be doing. And then, but it may not even be an outcome that they could have affected like some NPM library, some other thing. Suddenly, like you said, the attack landscape changes on a thing that was fine four months ago or three months right. ago. And it, it's a, it's a tough spot because it's a continuing thing. Right. And yeah, things I'm, change I'm, and, and we need to like, we need to help people build their skills. Like <laughs> we started doing this thing recently um, that we call hack along. And the idea is it's, it's a, I guess it's, it is a service. I mean, people pay for it, but the idea is what we do is we'll actually come partner with our customers and we'll sit with the developers and oh, wow. we will literally hack along with them and we'll help them um, explore like, how would you, we'll take, essentially what we do is we take a system that we've built to be vulnerable and we have them go through the principles of attacking it. And what winds up happening is now it's sort of going back to that metaphor of like the, the person who builds the skyscraper versus the demo expert. It would be like taking the contractor who builds the skyscraper and bringing them into the factory where the dynamite is made and being like, all right, here's a little like, you know, fake house. How would we blow it up? And then the contractor's like, I want to blow it up. And it yeah. winds up being really fun for everybody. And they sort of learn along the process. And the reason we do that, not only is it fun and experiential, but that kind of stuff actually helps improve development practices when they can start to really think like an attacker thinks.
And this is really, I, I love this. And in fact, your analogy is ideal, right? Because although we don't want to, we don't want to split the brain and the effort of the contractor when they're designing and building the building. But if you do show them active exploits, AKA the dynamite and the thermite and where you placed it and how you basically will tear this building down, it could, they can suddenly go like, I now I know what I can do to actually design differently to mm -hmm. maintain the stability, like physical engineering stability, and yet I can extend it in a new design methodology because I know how we're going to blow it up and what to what and why that ex is an exposure or an exploit. And the same thing then comes to system development where you're like, ooh, okay. So if I add, I'm building microservices, which is fantastic, but in doing so, I've created all of these injection points yeah. <laughs> and exposure points. You're like, oh, okay. So at every API endpoint, if I do this, it will, like, they do start to think, they don't have to be a hacker, but they can think closer to right. what a hacker would think. Yeah, so, uh, there's a couple of things that you've said throughout the course of our conversation today that I want, I want to connect these dots. You were talking about shift left and you were talking about uh, building security into the process. And um, of course, we've had this extended metaphor of like building a skyscraper. So one of the things that um, I'm always advocating, and the third dot you said, by the way, was also that people don't think about security till the end, right? And they like, oh, we're about to release the thing. Maybe we'd like run some scanner against it. And what I'm always advocating for people is to build security into the development process. Now that's often met with a lot of resistance. Oh, we have um, timelines. We have timeline pressure. Uh, my boss is breathing down my neck. We've got you know, all kinds of issues, and real business problems, not even security problems, business problems that say I can't do that. And so one of the things I, I did in the book was try to really dismantle that and to say, look, here's not only why you should build security in, but here's how to do it. Because when you think about no matter what type of development methodology we're talking about, whether we're talking about, you mentioned waterfall earlier, that's a linear sequential, which basically says, let's take the whole project and progress it one stage at a time, the whole project. Or if you're doing something that's more um, iterative, like agile, where it's like, we're going to take this, this feature, this user story, like you mentioned, and we're going to develop that. Either case, they go through the same steps. Right. Well, we have to establish the requirements. What are we building? Who are we building it for? What is it? What does it need to achieve? Well, in that room, in those conversations, you already have the right people talking about the right thing. It's just a little bit more of an extended conversation to say, so what does that mean that the system is going to provide access to? And what type of attackers are going to be interested in attacking it? And now when you move into the design phase, which is the next phase, you're able to say, okay, well, now not only do we know what we need to build this thing to do and who we're building it for, we also have an idea of what we need to protect and who and their associated capabilities might be interested in attacking the system. So let's think about designing our security model to consider that. So now think about that. Those are just thought exercises. That isn't even like, it's not even additional effort. Yeah. Now, when you start building the thing, you're building it in the right way. And I have this really funny metaphor that I think describes this perfectly. I have this buddy who has this uh, um, this really cool house, and he built this really cool roof deck on it. I mean, the thing's sick. It's got like you know plasma TVs, and it's got a fire pit, and it's got these really cool views and everything. But what it doesn't have is it doesn't have a permit. So basically, he had this house. <laughs> small thing. Wanted, small thing. But in his mind, he's like, I'll come back to that. Like, I'll just, I'm going to build this roof deck and then I'll go get it permit. Guys, I want to have a roof deck right now. I don't want to deal with the city's bureaucracy. So I'm going to like build this roof deck. He builds it. And then he just like forgot about getting the permit. And then years later, he goes to sell the house. And the house, you know, the buyer has an inspection as you do. And it flags that the inspection didn't necessarily say don't buy this house, but it said, hey, by the way, this roof deck, which is, of course, advertised as a major feature to this house, which is driving yeah. part of the price premium, that's not permitted. So that if you buy this house, that becomes your problem. And so what wound up, ha what wound up happening was that that scared like all the buyers away. So this buddy, what did he have to do? 
he was he he actually did a cost benefit analysis and he's like well i could lower the price to remove the price because pre- this thing like added substantial value to the house yeah. um he's like i could lower the price to sell the houses if it didn't have this thing or i could try to get it permitted and he found out there was no way he could get it permitted as built and so what he had to do is he had to there were he had to rip all kinds of stuff out like the way it was installed the hardware that was used the lumber that was used the like where things were attached that's what it's like when people try to build security later, right? That you build the thing and then when it matters, it's like, this is gonna be so much work to undo it. But if in the moment he was building the roof deck, he said, oh, I should use this lumber instead of that lumber. I should use this hardware instead of that hardware and I should install it, I should attach it in these ways instead of these ways. That's no difference in his level of effort, no difference other than he had to like ask those couple questions. And he would have been able to sell the house without a problem for the premium, without all the extra headache. People don't realize that, that in the moment, it's so much easier to think about security and it's so much harder to do it later. And, and it's often irreversible, like the point to, at, and for his example, especially too, right? Like I actually saw this recently in the newspaper, a similar type of story where somebody had built, an architect built this amazing house but they're like, ah, it's a, it goes a little further out in the lot line than I than they probably say is allowed. Well, they had to actually physically tear down the house because it was 36 inches wider. Like it wasn't even a problem. Like it was still the sidewalk. Everything was fine, but yeah. because it was not within the limits. And that's a regulation. That's simply a rule that right. maybe seems arbitrary. And I... I understand if I was the architect and the builder, I'd be horrified, I'd be angry, I'd be writing letters, sending emails. But in the end, that's a thing that they took a chance. Bring that analogy over to where you're compromising. Potentially, it's not tearing down your deck. It's that your customer's personal information is exposed to the earth Mm -hmm. because you chose to just you know do something later that you didn't think you had time for then i hope that more folks are moving towards at least at least putting awareness at, like if you're going to take it out of the plan or you're going to adjust the plan to lighten up how you approach it just make sure that we make this a core requirement like it should be part of every user story every user should be i user can click here and and put in their username and password and that's the user story, but it should be, which is then subsequently secured, sent in transit, encrypted. <laughs> right. We, we need to make sure that people, we have to automate that thinking and make yeah, it. Just, just I, I agree it. with you. Sorry, didn't mean to step on you there. Um, it's, and it's a leadership issue too. I mean, right. it really truly is that we're talking about it right now as a development issue, but if you put yourself in the shoes of a developer, right there, um, what are they trying to do? They're trying to make sure they hit the deadlines. They're trying to make sure they build the most efficient and clean code that they can. They want to build, you know, obviously a beautiful quality product. Then you make their boss happy. But if the leadership isn't making it possible to build security in, because where there's also leadership failures, they're like, do all that stuff and make it secure. You don't get any more time or resources to do so. Um, that's, that's not going to help anybody. But it really comes from the leadership who needs to be able to say, look, here's our security mission. Here's why it matters. Here's how we're going to uh, make sure that is actually integrated into the engineering process so that the developers can, in fact, do their job and do it well. The funny thing as we, you know, I'll say funny. I should be careful. I use the word funny. But it's like as we see the news headlines come up is the only time that people immediately think of disaster recovery and security because they mm-hmm. see something that happens and, and all they think is like their eyes wide up, like, oh, good golly, what if that had been my company? And they suddenly start to like go through the way, way back machine in their own development. Yeah. And they're like, I think we just pushed a product to production that we didn't do any security checks on. Like, I, That's why like you look at the chaos monkey as a method for forcibly taking systems out for cloud architecture patterns, which was a Mm -hmm. huge boost for people to like, they are literally designing for it to be ripped apart. We almost need chaos security. And I think there actually are some tools that are trying to do that. But in the end, 
the tool will always be designed with a specific scope. And this is why, I mean, I look at what you and the team are doing. It's not just your software security, it's physical security. You talk about RFID, you 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 actually have a great thing where you actually hack medical devices. Mm -hmm. Like this goes far beyond just the system development life cycle and, and code life cycle. There's really so much of the organization that needs to be wrapped in, which is why like pick a partner, pick an eight, pick a you hire somebody to take care of your fancy car because you want them to be really good at taking care of that fancy car. And that's all that they care about when it comes to security. You know, you don't have to talk up your company, Ted, because I will like go like ISE.io. It'll be at the link down below. Like these are, I've used folks in this vein before with organizations. And it's a huge relief because, you know, all you care about is the outcome of your reputation which is huge because every customer you've gone to relies on their reputation and it's your area of expertise and study so that I don't have to have it. Like we can do, I love that hack along concept. That's actually really, really cool that, you know, people can start to do that. But in the end, we hire experts for all these other things. And this is an area yeah. where you generally need a evolving expertise because it isn't just like today. All right, we're good today. Tomorrow, something happens right. <laughs> and it wasn't accounted for in the plan. Yeah, man. I mean, I, I, well, obviously I agree with you. You should hire outside experts. Uh, <laughs> one of the things I did do in the book was I, uh, I helped answer the question, like, how do you hire an expert? First of all, I made the case for why you need outside experts. Um, but I also explained like how to do it because they're not all created the same. And there's actually a lot of organizations out there that are presenting themselves as maybe more consultative, but really it's just running a tool. And so there's all kinds of tips and tricks for like, here's how you vet, here's, here's what to look for and, and everything. Um, but I, I did wanna remark on one of the observations that you made, which I totally agree with, which is that uh, a lot of the ideas that I wrote about in this book are much broader than application security, even though the subtitle, you know, how to do application security, right? That, that was, there, was a, there was a strategy to why I wrote the book about AppSec because, well, first of all, that's our, area of expertise. That's something I know intimately inside and out. Um, but also, you know, if you're going to write something, you can't write something that's everything to everybody. Right. And I knew that if I wrote a book about just like general security principles, we'd be like, oh, okay, what is that? So I wrote about a specific problem set. But what's interesting is that the principles in this book, they do apply to kind of everything. Um, the idea, the, the sort of core ideas through it are like, well, first you have to have the right mindset and then you have to approach the way that you work with a security partner appropriately. And then you have to have them do the right, you need to know what it is that they're doing. And then you need to make sure that the appropriate level of rigor is done. And then you have to fix the problems that are found. And then like we talked about, you have to hack it again. And then you have to understand the correlation between effort and cost. Like that's one of the big questions people are always asking, like how much should I budget for this? And I answered that head on. And then I brought it all together to answer the question that's often not even necessarily asked, which is, how do we prove this? How, how do we prove the return on this investment? And security is often measured as the removal of a bad thing. Like we didn't get hacked and that's great. And we should continue thinking about security that way. But I argue that security done right is not just the removal of a bad thing. It's also the pursuit of a good thing. And it's the world that we live in today. People, organizations, companies want to work with other companies that are secure and that can prove it. Right. And the ideas in this book essentially first show you how to secure it and then show you how to prove it. And even though, you know, back to the original point, even though it's written about securing software systems, software runs the world. And so software systems, they're in cars, they're in medical devices, they're in airplanes, they're, you know, pick your, pick your poison and uh, application security is all security in a lot of ways. <laughs> the, 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 I remembered when I was fighting for budget. And this is like, so even like you talk about the method, right? This is actually straight up behavioral economics and behavioral psychology too, right? Loss aversion is a much larger driver for taking action than gain, right? So if you tell somebody that you will gain 20% more security, like there's some, some metric you apply, 
it, they probably won't buy it. But if you say what you're doing is you're removing the risk of a graphic loss, like is this going to be something that you are going to see on CNBC? <laughs> like <laughs> this is a real problem. They can envision it and it will drive a behavior of action. So in a way, there's an advantage that we've, we unlock that and hopefully create practices of gain as a result of doing it, right? Like injecting this into the de development life cycle, injecting it into the training of the people, right? This is also the problem is that we don't put it in house often, you know, even just partially, yeah. but make sure to keep people up to date instead of the once a year, goofy 22 minute video you got to watch to say that you know not to like let somebody piggyback on your way through the door like just like the hr compliance thing that people have to take that's their understanding of security quite often and it's like oh yep. good golly there's so much more to it and i'd love to actually hear your thoughts ted as a practitioner or somebody that wants to get into the practice of delving more into this infosec and and what are the areas that they can reach into. I mean, I know there's obviously big events like the DEF CONs and the, uh, you know, the, the major security conferences, RSA, of course, hosts a large one on the enterprise security side, but B-Sides is one that I really adore as far as a, a local thing. So what, where do you go, you know, when you want to sort of find people of common interest that you can learn together with? Yeah, well, certainly from a learning perspective, there's a little book called Hackable that has a lot yeah, of principles. Right. People can read. No, I'm just, I'm just kidding. Um, Hackable is actually really accessible for people of really any degree of uh, ex expertise, experience. But yeah, where do I go? Um, you actually enumerated the places that I go. Uh, DEF CON is definitely my favorite in terms of that's where like the heart of security research is happening. Um, it's culturally it's unlike any event you'll ever go to and it's like that is a true statement <laughs> it's it's a weird place man but it's awesome in its weirdness and um so yeah defcon is where you'll you it, it's funny because it's almost intimidating at defcon because you go there and it's like well here's this guy talking about how he's hacking satellites like for for a newbie that's like you're you don't even know what to do with that information but yeah like 40, I don't know what the number is, but my guess would be at least 40% of attendees at places like DEF CON are newbies. So there's like a ton of programming for newbies. Um, one of the things I think that is has been a silver lining, a real positive that came out of the pandemic is the, all these virtual events. So for example, our organization, we run uh, one of the villages that runs at DEF CON and RSA and other places called IoT Village. And we were forced to figure out how can you deliver that virtually. And so now there's a version of it that has actually had this amazing benefit that it's removed the travel barrier. So now people are like from India or you know places around the planet who maybe weren't ever going to fly to DEF CON. Wow, they now yeah, can yeah. go get this access uh, to this information online. They're able to watch. It's the same speakers, giving the same content. Some of the programming you can't do because you need to like, if there's anything involving hardware, like that's difficult, but we figured out how to turn some of our labs and our capture the flag contests into virtual things. There's tons of people doing that kind of stuff. So um, I do think that starting with DEF CON, looking at the villages, uh, iotvillage.org is the site for R1. Um, there's tons more villages, of course. I would say um, there's lots of information that you can get at places like Plural Site. Uh, Udemy. Um, I'm about to launch a course actually on infosec skills that's based on my book. It comes nice. out really soon. Uh, I don't have the exact date, but I want to say in the next like two weeks, it's going to be live. Oh, great. And what's cool about infosec skills, I really like that platform, is that um, unlike something like, say, Udemy, and this isn't, I'm not dismissing Udemy, I think the place is great, but it's like with a place like that, you buy a course and you can attend the course. But infosec skills is a platform. And so the idea is you subscribe to it and you get unlimited access to it's like 7,000 courses for uh, a low annual or monthly fee. And um, I can give you, if you want to put in the show notes, there's a discount code so people can get like half off it if they wanted oh, to go. Perfect. And, yeah, that'd be great. Out. But that's definitely InfoSec skills is, is where I would go for sure. And, uh, and you can check out my course. You can, you can listen to me for eight hours straight, talk about all this stuff. You do your own audiobook. I got to ask because uh, first of all, you're 
The book is great in that it's written in a way that's readable, but gets to important stuff. It's a really, really tough barrier to get into like technical discussion sometimes and not like you said before, like it's easy to lose a reader or a listener and the, the ability to make it relatable and giving it like, yeah, using analogies, using stuff that it put it in your own mindset. It's very, very easy for people to, to wrap their heads around it and then get excited about continuing through this listening or reading journey. And it's, uh, I often say, like, like, look, 40% of, you know, like I, I would say this is a reasonable number. There's always a freshman class, right? There's always, always folks that are new to it. And even if they've been in it for a while, maybe they're new to a new type of thing yep. that they should explore. Uh, and a lot, what I love about these conferences too, is they talk about like real human physical security stuff. They literally have like people doing like minimal self-defense, you know, classes, like how to take care when you're walking in Vegas at two o'clock uh -huh. in the morning. Like they, it is much more than just pure software stuff there. It's a great community. It's a really interesting, diverse community for sure. <laughs> but, uh, I, I, I love it. Well, Ted, thank you very much. This has been a real pleasure. And like I said, I'm going to recommend folks definitely the, the book. I'll be happy to get through it and give you the full recap on it. We'll yeah, make sure we right. get links to all the other stuff, links to the book and to your course. So uh, that's exciting. I really love, yeah. I love these platforms that they can make the stuff accessible to people. And like you said, no one will say that anything we've gone through in the past two years is can be classed as good, but of the outcomes we captured from it, the best we got was that we we democratized access mm -hmm. to a lot of things that were a travel barrier before. It's hard though yeah. that we miss it. Like it when you've got a three day virtual conference. Uh, uh, <laughs> I can't do it. I can't, I can't stare yeah, at a screen a that day. <laughs> so, all no, right. I agree with you. Yeah. Well, well thank, thank you. Know, thanks for having me. And uh, if for everyone listening or, or watching, uh, if there are, if what we talked about today triggers questions, uh, you know, my, my mission, my goal is to be a resource to people. So if there's any way that I can help, uh, if you have, uh, you want to reach out to me, you want to figure out where to follow me on social media, you want to learn more about my book, you want to learn more about that course I was mentioning, you want to learn more about uh, our our security consulting, like whatever it is that I can help you with, just go to tedharrington.com. And I'm super responsive. I respond to all the messages that come in. And you know, however I can help you, let's let me do that. I love it. Excellent. Ted Harrington, thank you very much. And uh, as he says, go to tedharrington.com. Buy Hackable. It's an awesome book. <laughs> and uh, it's really, really been great spending time. Thank you for having me. Appreciate it.